how I cursed that load. On the trail. Four friends set out to take their two-week summer holidays from work, climbing to the headwaters of Seymour Creek in North Vancouver, British Columbia. It's 1909. Their aim is to climb, survey and map, paint and photograph the uncharted territory around Loch Lomond, the source of Seymour Creek, for the Vancouver Mountaineering Club. The friends will spend two weeks in total, four days climbing up there, a week exploring the headwaters area, and four days returning to town. Two of the men had been in the area the year before. This journal and the photographs are by Charles Chappie Chapman, my grandfather. This book, Holiday 1909, combines his text and images. I have added historical notes, writings from other climbers, drawings, and short biographies of the four climbers. How I Cursed That Load is a line from The Cremation of Sam McGee by Robert W. Service. In Chappie's photo album of the trip, captions are often bits of poetry. Shelley and Shakespeare are also quoted below the photos and in his journal. Robert W. Service was a banking clerk in the Yukon and was inspired by tales of the Klondike Gold Rush. His first two poems, The Shooting of Dan McGrew and The Cremation of Sam McGee, enjoyed immediate popularity and his further works enabled him to move to the French Riviera. The caption in Chappie's photo album for this image is commencement of our holiday, the trail. In those days, Seymour Creek had not yet been dammed. The Burrard Lillouette Trail was built by the government in 1877 at the urging of cattle ranchers. It followed the west side of Seymour Creek to the headwaters. From there, it continued up to the Pemberton Valley and east to Lillouette. It was in poor condition in 1909, although it was still used by miners, loggers, and trappers. To get to the trail, they took a skid road built by logging enterprises. This was the first part of the journey. Their tramp would be 32 miles, or 51 kilometers long, with a rise in elevation of 3,400 feet, or 1,037 meters. It would take them four days. These are the four men, all members of the fledgling Vancouver Mountaineering Club, later called the British Columbia Mountaineering Club. The club's purpose was to survey the mountains, valleys, and ice fields of the lower mainland, to study flora and fauna, to advocate for the preservation of the natural beauty of the region, and finally to encourage others to enjoy the mountains. This fella at the top is Charles Chapman, Chappie for short, my grandfather. Check out the hobnail boots and the putties, those wrappings around his legs. They protected his pants from the underbrush and kept debris out of his boots. Chappie left school at just 12 years old to apprentice to a printer. He became a lifelong learner, going to night school for years and eventually collecting a wide-ranging library of literature. Chappie was known to quote from memory Long passages from Shakespeare, Robert W. Service, Byron, and his other favorite writers. Chappie loved the outdoors and was an avid photographer, singer, gardener, and writer. A printer by trade, he owned a print and stationery shop in downtown Vancouver. Chappie was a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society and president of the Canadian Council of Printers. He was a president of British Columbia Mountaineering Club for two terms and later honorary president 
and had a part in preserving the Garibaldi area for Park. For 10 years, the club had lobbied the British Columbia government to set aside Mount Garibaldi and the surrounding area as Park Preserve. This was finally realized in 1920 at the end of Chappie's two terms as club president. Fred Perry, Perry for short. Perry was a tailor and a founding member of the British Columbia Mountaineering Club. He also later became an honorary president. By 1911, he led the botanical section of the club, a branch that grew and eventually became Nature Vancouver. A trailblazer both in first descents and ecology, Perry wrote extensively about the variety of alpine plants, their medicinal uses, and their environment. He also seems to have had a pretty good sense of humor. Perry was usually the mouse catcher at the Red Shack Cabin, the first club cabin on Grouse Mountain. The climbers had to clear out the mice before the grub was unpacked at the beginning of a trip, and apparently Perry excelled at this. Joking around was common in Chappie's photos. Check out all those poor little mice strung up by their tails, the knife, the rifle, the hatchet, the ammo in his belt, the conquering hero pose. The photo's caption is the Nimrod. The word has a double meaning, mighty hunter and also goofball. This is Charles MacDonald, or Old Mac. Old because Mac was 34. The others were all in their 20s. Charlie was originally from Nova Scotia and by 1909 had traveled the world working on sailing ships and painting the sights he saw. In Vancouver, he worked as a sign painter. An accomplished watercolorist, Charlie packed his painting equipment for this trip. While researching this book, I discovered that I had inherited one of his paintings. This is a watercolor of the Red Shack, the first British Columbia Mountaineering Club cabin on Grouse Mountain. Named red reflecting, perhaps, the socialist views of its builders, Billy Gray, Fred Perry, Charles Chapman, Fred Mills, and especially Old Mac, a known socialist. This photo was taken inside the Red Shack and shows the four friends before their trip, probably on their Christmas holidays. From the right, they are Charles Chapman, Billy Gray, Charlie MacDonald, and Fred Perry. The other climber on the left is Fred Mills. The photo was taken using flashlight. In 1909, interior photography, flash photography, was achieved by filling a pan with flash powder, which was then ignited, leading to a small explosion which provided a bright light. Simultaneously, the photo was taken. Many photographers were injured in this process. Fortunately, not these men. This is the menu from the Red Shack Christmas dinner. A feast. They carried all this food and alcohol on their backs up to the Grouse Mountain cabin. At the bottom of the menu is written, Whiskey Punch. Bliss, yum, yum. This is a mixture of simple syrup, lemon, soda, and of course, whiskey. After their dinner, and likely several drinks, they performed a play they had written for the festive holiday. Here is old Mac showing one of his landscape paintings to Perry at the camp at Loch Lomond. That's Billy Gray peeking sleepily out of the tent. He didn't like to be photographed, I think. William Gray. William, or Billy, was a born woodsman, bushwhacking the trail ahead of others, packing the heaviest loads, surveying and drawing maps. He blazed the first trail into Garibaldi and was on first ascents of local mounts Bishop, Jarrett, Seymour, Shear, Coliseum, Burwell, Ben Lomond, Mamquam, and Black Tusk. Billy was also a founding member of the British Columbia Mountaineering Club, 
and club president from 1912 to 1914. In 1909, he was apprenticed to a cigar maker, but by 1917, he was studying geology at the University of British Columbia. It was with one of his teachers, Professor Charles Drysdale, that Billy died. Billy and Professor Drysdale were both swept away fording the raging Kootenai River in late spring. Drysdale was conducting a geological study, and Billy was hired on for the summer to help. Billy was only 27 when he died. The four men took the ferry across Burrard Inlet, Vancouver's harbor, to the foot of Lonsdale, and rode the Lynn Valley electric car line to the top of Grand Boulevard, which was the terminus at the time. Then they walked. Here they are at the start of the skid road, the beginning of their four-day trek. Frank Smith, a fellow climber of the day, writes about the general appearance of climbers at the time. To modern mountaineers, the appearance of a climber of 50 years ago, and this is now over 100 years ago, would cause amusement, if not mirth. Everybody wore their oldest clothes, and a few trips reduced them to rags. The appearance of lady climbers was even more hideous. They were forced by the laws of polite society to wear a skirt reaching to their heels and clothed above in some form of blouse with long sleeves. The skirt had to be discarded at the first opportunity and cashed beside the trail. A rule of the ferry company forbade any lady to board the ferry attired in bloomers, and on one occasion an unfortunate bloomer girl could not find her skirt at the end of the trip. Had to, she had to send word across and have some relative come over with a skirt to enable her to get home. This photo shows British Columbia Mountaineering Club climbers at the Garibaldi camp in 1911 in a wide variety of outfits. The men hiked up the skid road past Rice Lake. It was 32 miles, or 51 kilometers, to Loch Lomond, the source of the Seymour Creek, and a rise in elevation of 3,400 feet, or 1,037 meters. In dress, we were several degrees removed from drawing room attire. The oldest coat we possessed, an old shirt, brown overalls, putties, and a pair of strong, hobnailed boots, with an old hat, a sweater, a change of underwear, and an extra pair of socks. Look at their huge packs, with their jackets draped over the tops. Frank Smith writes again, Before pack sacks and boards were developed, the general method of packing was to pile blankets, equipment, and food in the center of a sheet of oilcloth about six feet by four, later used as a ground sheet. The pile then was wrapped up like a parcel and secured with pack straps made from old army surplus. This was never an easy procedure, even if carried out on the floor of one's bedroom, but carried out in a creek bed in the rain, with smoke in one's eyes and mosquito in one's neck. It called for endurance and profanity of the highest order. Food for two weeks, a Dutch oven, frying pan, plates, cups, utensils, two cameras, film, books, paper for mapping, an axe, blankets, surveying equipment, an aneroid for determining elevation, knives, extra clothes, a microscope, watercolor paints, a rifle, and a pie. One of our old lady friends kindly presented us with pie as we were leaving. Perry ungallantly refused to accept it, but Billy brought it along, and a very awkward present it proved, for it was necessary to carry in the hand and the plate was heavier than four plates put together. I might say at one stage, I exchanged the gun for a pie, but after carrying it for about a mile, I was very pleased to hand the pie to Mac and take the gun again, and the gun weighed seven pounds. They ate the pie the first night. Here is a close-up of Billy gallantly carrying the pie. This is the shopping list for their trip. Flour, oats, sugar, dried fruit, ham, bacon, salt pork, beans, rice, butter, coffee, and tea. Perry had made canvas sacks for the food at his tailor shop at 834 Pender Street. All of this was divided into four waterproofs, 
strapped up and carried on their backs. Maybe they cooked oatmeal with dried fruit for breakfast, or bacon and cheese with quick bread made in the Dutch oven. Perhaps salt pork and beans for dinner? They also sourced berries and protein on the trail, fish and deer if they were lucky. Most of these images are from Chappie's album, but this one is from the Charles Draycott Fawns at Manova, the North Vancouver archives. It shows a wagon loaded with shingle bolts, timber cut in four-foot sections, on the skid road near Rice Lake, the same skid road at the start of the four men's trek. Shingle bolts are floating in Rice Lake in the background. Shingles were needed for the booming housing industry locally and were exported as well. The lower Seymour Valley was divided into preemptions, government land deeded to people willing to cultivate or settle it, and district lots for logging and shake mills. In 1909, over 200 people were in Lynn Valley, cutting trees and splitting them up for shingles. All in. This is one of old Max cartoons. I bet they were all in. It's the end of the first day's climb and their camp is at an elevation of 425 feet or 130 meters, a little above the first waterwork intake on Seymour Creek. This drawing shows the Burrard Lillooet cattle trail route. Burrard Inlet, Howe Sound, Lillooet, Squamish, and Britannia Beach are marked. The cross-hatched line in this close-up goes along Seymour Creek from the mouth to the source, Loch Lomond Lake. This is the route the four men traveled. The red line shows how the trail connected to Squamish. On the second day of the climb, the skid road ends and they hike up the old cattle trail. It was in rough shape. It had been blazed 35 years before at the urging of cattle interests in the interior and at great expense to the province. Cattle were herded over the trail only once with rather disastrous results. The cattle could not handle the trail's steep grade and not a single animal survived, according to one writer. Another report told of a cow throwing herself over a cliff, apparently choosing to die instead of continuing. Perhaps an exaggeration, but it was a debacle and never tried again. On day two of their climb, at 10.30, we passed an enormous rock, which had torn its way through the forest, leveling mighty trees and leaving a wide lane to mark its passage. They reached Seymour Falls late that day. Above the falls, the creek opens into a smooth, placid stream, the sloping banks covered with tall firs and cedars, casting a deep shadow upon the quiet waters, which reflect every leaf and branch so vividly that it is difficult to tell where the water begins or vegetation ceases. Seymour Falls was dammed in 1928 to create Seymour Lake, a reservoir. The next part of the cattle trail they traveled along and this beautiful scene is now underwater. This Metro Vancouver map shows the progression of dams. In 1909, there was just the intake. Additional dams were built in 1913, 1924, and 1928 as water needs for Metro Vancouver communities increased. At the end of day two, they camped at an elevation of 600 feet or 180 meters in a miner's shack like this, fishing in the creek for their dinner. Mac, despite being a Nova Scotian, brought only one small fish to the frying pan. He was then subjected to a very severe and outspoken criticism of his ability as a fisherman by Perry, who has an enviable command of vituperative language and used it fluently on this occasion. They hiked about 10 miles on day three and camped along Seymour Creek at an altitude of 850 feet or 260 meters. Looks wet and miserable, doesn't it? The journal continues. 
We passed a terrible night in camp, the rain falling incessantly and the mosquitoes and sandflies plaguing us fearfully. A shelter had been erected for the grub, but Perry and I managed to get under it as well. Billy and Max slept under the trees. On day four, they begin the last and hardest leg of the trek. On the way, they meet the men of Jungle Town. We crossed several new bridges over small creeks running into the main stream and came across a party of miners. Building a bridge was a very simple matter with them. Two large trees were felled and placed parallel to each other across the creek at a distance of about four feet. Then, cross logs were laid on and the bridge was finished. Jungle Town was a supply depot for miners prospecting further up the trail around the headwaters of the Seymour and Britannia Creeks. The miners were of various nationalities and strong, hardy men, although the one in the middle wearing a cap appears to be just a boy. Just before we left Jungle Town, we noticed one miner making strenuous efforts to lift his pack from a tree stump. The others seemed to think it was a huge joke, especially when the victim discovered that his pack was nailed down. The woods were busy then with miners, prospectors, trappers, and the rare hiker. There were miners' shacks, trappers' shacks, surveyors' shacks, and if currently unoccupied, anyone could stay in them, as long as it was left tidy and stocked with wood. This is the cookhouse shack at the mine. A bit worse for wear, isn't it? They were to complete 32 miles this day. It was another 10 miles or 16 kilometers before they would camp exhausted on the banks of Loch Lomond Lake. Their gain in elevation that day was 2,550 feet, or 780 meters. The last leg of the climb sounds a bit grim. Chappie describes it. It seemed a never-ending climb. The trail was very steep and winding, and our packs grew heavier and heavier. With slow and painful steps, we straggled up and across a large rock slide where the footing at times is very precarious. And I wondered how the pack horses traveled such a rough and rocky road. A heavy fog hung around us, the bushes dripping with moisture. We were wet through, hungry, exhausted. Billy insisted on completing the journey that night. How we managed that last long pull is hard to describe. A heartbreaking, bone-aching, weary tramp it was. At last, a yell from Billy came echoing through the fog. We had arrived. This was their destination, Loch Lomond Lake, the headwater of Seymour Creek. Elevation 3,400 feet or 1,037 meters. Their camp on the banks of Loch Lomond was simple. Some saplings lashed together with a couple of their waterproofs over top to form their tent. Other saplings and wood formed their table and cooking area. Clothing is thrown over a tree branch to dry. The first thing we did was to build a fire. Billy then produced some tent poles which he had cached the previous year, and with a couple of our waterproofs he erected a small tent. The other waterproof was laid on the ground for us to sleep on, and the grub carefully stored away. Perry busied himself with making the bread and preparing the supper. We turned in. Though our blankets were wet, we were particularly gratified to find we had left the mosquitoes behind. You can see the wire to the camera again in this shot, coming from Chappie's hands under the table towards the viewer, the camera. Here is that close-up again. Old Mac is showing Perry one of his watercolors while Billy peers sleepily out of the tent. Those are Billy cans hanging on the pole over the fire keeping water warm for tea, I expect. Clothes are drying further along the pole. Around the campfire, they enjoy a rest after dinner. This image is a time exposure. The camera's shutter is kept open long enough to capture their faces in the firelight. The fire is blurry because it was in motion, but the men would have to be very still for the better part of a minute. All four men are in the photo. Perhaps you could see this tiny white line coming from under Chappie's left arm. 
He's second from the right. The line is a wire or thread that leads to the shutter release of the camera. Chappie looks a bit anxious. He's hoping it works. For this photo, Chappie had set the camera up, with the others already seated, leaving a place for him. Then he would lay down the wire without putting tension on it and take his place with the others, then carefully tighten up the wire until it activated the shutter release. Then they would have to sit very still while the shutter slowly opened and closed, exposing the film. The gnawing hunger of lonely men. Robert W. Service again, from the shooting of Dan McGrew. Breakfast time at their campsite. That's Chappie on the left, and coming from his right hand is the wire to the camera shutter release again. During the morning, Billy apparently got tired of his inactivity. In telling us that he was going for a tramp for a few hours, he disappeared into the fog. Just as we were finishing dinner, he came into camp, wet to the skin, and hungry as a wolf. He had climbed down several miles to Jungle Town, then ascended over 1,000 feet, or 300 meters, back to camp between breakfast and lunch. When he had eaten, he told us he had been back to Jungle Town to fetch his tripod, which he'd forgotten the previous day. He found it hanging upon the newly erected sign with a paper attached and laboriously inscribed thereon all that was left of the camera what took Jungle Town. The tripod was essential for Billy's surveying work and for Chappie's photography. Day five was a day of rest, much needed. On day six, they began to explore. Billy started his surveying work and drew this scale map. Loch Lomond, headwaters of Seymour Creek. Here is their campsite. The top right shows Dunsanan Ridge, now called Bagpipe Peak. The cross-hatched line shows the Lillooet Trail. The Lillooet Trail follows the south and west shore of the lake. We followed the trail to the northwestern end of the lake and reached the divide where the waters part. A gentle slope of snow and heather led us to another lake which forms the source of Britannia Creek. This image shows Billy Gray surveying. Billy carried with him a plane table and various instruments of weird construction with which to make his observations. He also carried a hug wooden tripod for the double purpose of surveying and photography. Billy also carried an aneroid, a barometer used to determine elevation. This is a topographical map of the area. Loch Loman is on the lower right, and Utopia Lake, the source of Britannia Creek, is top left. Chappie's journal calls the area to the left of Ben Lomond, Vulcan's Valley, but this place name is no longer in use. This is Chappie's photo of Utopia Lake west of Loch Lomond Head and south of the Sawteeth Range. In 1916, the Britannia Mines Company dammed Utopia Lake to produce electric power for copper ore processing. We explored the valley for some distance. It was about two miles long and half mile wide. Some prospector claim stakes and the preliminary workings for copper were examined, and Perry reported on the ore values. It was in this area that Britannia mines extracted enormous amounts of copper some years later, bringing it by tunnel and rail to Britannia Beach for processing. It was once the biggest copper mine in the world. Here is the area courtesy of Google Earth. Lower right is Loch Lomond, where they camped. Seymour Creek goes south from there. Britannia Creek is shown in the middle and flows to the left or west into Howe Sound. Sky Pilot then was known as part of the Sawtooth Range, or the Sisters. This photo shows the Sisters, also called the Sawtooth Range, in the background, with one of the climbers in the foreground, looking at the glorious vista. These peaks are now called Sky Pilot, Co-Pilot, and Ledge. Big mountains heave to heaven. 
another view of the sawtooth range, and a quote from Service. We followed the valley until we reached a part where it began to drop rapidly. And here we had a splendid view of the peaks of the Sawtooth Range, rising to an altitude of about 7,000 feet. On day six, they climbed Loch Lomond Head, now called Ben Lomond. Two of the climbers are pictured here at the right, approaching the peak of Loch Lomond Head, a mighty pyramid of rock rising to 5,400 feet or 1,645 meters. Billy and Perry had been in this area the year before and recorded the first ascent of Ben Lomond. The summit is one mass of large, loose boulders of granite, and Mac found no lack of missiles for indulging in a favorite amusement, tumbling down rocks which were ground to powder in their descent. We yelled at him to stop, politely intimating that we were not desirous of becoming part of a rock slide. The Summit Lake District map from 1912 by a group of climbers calling themselves the Rebel Bunch shows the valley well. The Queen of Sheba peaks are top right, Jungle Town, Dunsinane Ridge, Vulcans Valley, Loch Lomond Head, Shadow Peak, Mount Shear, and the Sisters are all marked. The Rebel Bunch consisted of Loretta Hannafin, Ben Hannafin, Edward LePage, and Don Mundy. They were there in late May of 1912, and the area was still covered with snow. In their record of the climb, they noted a cabin at Utopia Lake and work proceeding on a dam. This would have been the beginning of the dam Britannia Mines completed in 1916. The Rebel Bunch tried to climb Sky Pilot, but they were driven back by bad weather. Looking northward from the peak of Loch Lomond Head, what a view. Scattered across the straggling brush were many bright grassy patches with beautiful pools of pure, clean water, and buttercups and daisies springing all around. A magnificent panorama stretched around us. Looking northward, the huge bulk of Garibaldi and Monte Rosa with its glaciers and moraines. Monte Rosa is now called Mamquam Mountain. Garibaldi is shrouded in the clouds looking south from the peak of Loch Lomond Head. The Lions, Crown, White, Cathedral, and Brunswick. These mountain panoramas are several negative exposures, developed back in Vancouver in a dark room, then cut and pasted together. When you take the shots, you need to line up the horizon and overlap the photos to allow for lens distortion at the sides. Now we just choose the panorama setting on our phones. This is Chappie's camera, a Kodak Folding 4A Model B. It is quite large and weighs about four and a half pounds or two kilos. It takes a large format negative roll. It was the best amateur camera sold at the time. He took this along to Loch Loman in his pack. It was quite an accomplishment to take these photos. They transported on their backs and in bad weather, the camera and unexposed film. The camera had to be kept out of the weather. Its bellows are leather and can develop mold. The film had to be kept dry and in the dark or it would be ruined. Chappie loaded the film roll into the camera in the dark and in the dripping woods, climbed the mountain, set the camera on the tripod or some rocks, adjusted the aperture and shutter setting, took the photos, and transported the exposed film canisters and equipment back to Vancouver in more bad weather. Then he developed the film in a dark room, printed the images, and pasted them together. Photography has changed so much. The images were taken for photo albums and also to show at the club's talks in downtown Vancouver about climbing. The photos were also placed with articles about climbs in local newspapers promoting club excursions. They spent seven days in all at the headwaters exploring, climbing three mountains, painting, photographing, surveying, 
mapping and getting hungry. On our way back to camp, we saw a wild duck with three young ones swimming in the lower lake. After a little thought, we concluded the young ones were old enough to look after themselves, and roast duck appeared appetizing in perspective. Mac opened fire with ball cartridges, but after five shots, during which the duck seemed to be at the center of a maelstrom, he handed the rifle to Perry, who, with two more shots, completed the fusillade, and the bird still lived. All of the ammunition was exhausted, and our hopes for a change of diet fell to zero as we left the scene of our humiliation. Unfortunately, Chappie's journal ends here, but his photos continue the story. They climbed Mount Shear, 5,600 feet, or 1,706 meters. Later, when asked why it was named Shear and not Shear, S-H-E-E-R, as in Shear Drop, Old Mac said it was because it sheared the clouds. I think that's Fred Perry with his distinctive hat sitting in the foreground with the forbidding mass of sheer mountain beyond him. They climbed Dunsanan Ridge, now called Bagpipe Peak. Loch Lomond Head is on the left, Shadow Peak on the right, with the sisters in the right background. Shadow Peak is now known as Red Mountain. And they tried to climb Sky Pilot, the most challenging peak of the Sawtooth Range. Frank Smith writes, They met with adverse weather conditions, but during their stay made an attempt on the Sawtooth Range. Clouds and rain turned them back, and they barely reached the base of the peaks. On August 4th, they start for home, retracing their steps, partway on the first day, passing by Jungle Town again, and descending 2,550 feet, or 780 meters. This panorama looks north from the eastern peak of the Queen of Sheba's Breasts. On August 6, they climbed up a ridge west of Seymour Creek to one of the two peaks they called the Queen of Sheba's Breasts. The two peaks were side by side, and they were lonely men in the woods. Now you can see the great bulk of Garibaldi far off in the distance, and in the middle, the Saw Teeth Range. This panorama looks south from the same place. The distinctive peaks of the lions are near the center. This is the artist Sarah Goodwin's rendering of the return route with Ben Lomond in the top bubble. This is the start of their return route. Sarah also designed the cover of Holiday 1909. They strike out along the ridge to the west of Seymour Creek heading south. Smith writes, on their way back, they left the Seymour Valley below the junction of the main and west creeks, and climbing to the ridge on the west side of the valley, continued their progress south along the skyline, finally crossing the summit of White Mountain. This rugged route has never since been followed, and it speaks well for the robust character of these early mountaineers that they should attempt it on the return trip from a strenuous holiday. Sarah shows their route up to Loch Lomond as a dotted red line, and the return route as a solid red line. The red dotted line on this Google map image shows the path of the return route. Loch Lomond is circled near the top of the image. They left Loch Lomond heading south down the valley and climbed up to a ridge marked with the red dotted line, following the top of the ridge south to Cathedral Mountain. A fortnight's trip, Skookum. This is another of old Mac's cartoons, drawn to illustrate a talk about their trip. The four men had spent two weeks climbing, photographing, surveying, painting, and enjoying the beauty of the mountains, returning by climbing over the tops of peaks. Skookum indeed. Pretty much out of use now, the term Skookum is a Chinook word. Chinook jargon was a trade language in the Pacific Northwest. To increase membership, the British Columbia Mountaineering Club promoted their trips at talks at Pender Hall on Dunsmuir Street in downtown Vancouver. This drawing was likely a lantern slide, a precursor of the slide projector. 
The image was drawn on glass and projected onto a surface with a strong light, a lantern. On their way back on August 6, they clean up in a mountain tarn. Much needed after their exertions, I'm sure. They start down the ridge from the north towards Cathedral Mountain. The next day, they climb Cathedral Mountain. It's August and there's still lots of snow. On the summit of Cathedral, they take another group photo. From the right, Charles Chapman, then Charles McDonald, Billy Gray, with Fred Perry at the left. Here again, you can see the wire to the camera shutter release, but this time, it's Perry that's holding it. The wire was still vibrating from being pulled when the camera shutter tripped. It's wiggling and out of focus. This is a satellite view of Cathedral Mountain. The green dotted line traces their route along the ridge. The red dotted line shows their path across Cathedral and White Mountain. They cross the summit of White Mountain and descend to the trails leading past Norvan Falls and into Lynn Valley and to the streetcar at Grand Boulevard. In Mac's last cartoon, we ended our trip by chasing a car into town. He draws them looking pretty rough by now, with long hair and beards, holes in their pants, and ragged sleeves. The streetcar passengers and conductor seem alarmed by their appearance. They run for the last streetcar to the ferry at the foot of Lonsdale and cross over to Vancouver and then home after a strenuous two weeks holiday in August of 1909. We thank you for your kind appreciation and attention.